Hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Today, I thought I'd talk to you about my first impressions of Robinson Crusoe by Portal Games. For, well, one main very particular reason and another caveat that's important for you to be aware of. First off, the main particular reason is this game is currently over on GameFound and the Deluxe Collector's Edition is going to be available there. So, if you're interested, if you've thought about picking up a copy of Robinson Crusoe before, if you've been compelled by the idea of a brutal island-based survival uh, little narrative puzzle, not really narrative, I suppose, mechanical puzzle with a narrative element, then you might want to swing over there, link at the top video of this, uh, you know, showing it off. That makes it timely. That makes it interesting. The other thing that you should be aware of is I've only played this once so far. I was taught by a friend, he borrowed a copy, brought it over, got it down to the table. So this is going to be one of our Played It Once series, where I talk to you about my first impressions, my initial thoughts, and why, for myself, I can totally understand why people are so immensely compelled by and in love with this game. I have to say, when I first got into the hobby, Robinson Crusoe was one of those games that I picked up off the shelf, purchased brought home, and then never table, because I was always intimidated. And the more I dove in, the more I read information on Robinson Crusoe, the more intimidated I became. This is one of those games that presents itself as a unapologetic challenge, a game that has degrees of cascading failure, a game that has some randomness in the card draw and the dice rolling that could result in the entire story coming to a cataclysmic ending, or if you're able to struggle and survive, to craft the right bits and bobs and pieces, if you're able to put all of that together, this is a game that presents itself as one of the best solo and cooperative puzzles available. And it's been a few years since I purchased my copy. In that time, I have played and learned a ton of other games, and Robinson Crusoe for me sort of fell to the sidelines. I thought, well, maybe now I'm past it. Maybe it was an intro. Maybe it was something that I should have experienced. It, along with Terraforming Mars and Spirit Island and a lot of the other titles that I'm covering in these First Impression series. And if you notice all of the awards stretched down here across the bottom, there's a fair reason to be intrigued by and also intimidated by this title. How can so many people love it? How can so many people be captivated by and drawn back in? Why has it got the footprint it does in our hobby. And why does now it justify, uh, through GameFound, why, why now does it justify a brand new collector's edition? Why are people ravenous and backing and excited to get not only another version of this, but a new and upgraded, a uh, big box version of Robinson Crusoe? And by the way, Portal Games does not know I'm doing this video. Uh, we are not sponsored for this video. I, uh, I just had a chance to play it. Now, I played this partially because the Game Found Pledge was going on, but I've also been intending to get it to the table, and, and what I was expecting wasn't what I found. I didn't quite know what I thought Robinson Crusoe would be. I was thinking maybe little miniatures on a map moving kind of across a board with events that sequenced and horrible things that happened, but... It's a lot more mechanically driven than I think I initially approached. You're going to have your workers. It's a worker allocation game. They work as your resource. And you're going to be positioning them in different locations around the board, deciding if you want to invest in building or scouting to explore the island, producing to gather wood and, uh, and other resources like food from the location that you're currently in. You're going to be uh, taking time to rest and get your own stats up or building different equipment and gear that's all uh, set or randomized in every event. And you're potentially going to be facing off with other creatures, beasts, monsters, and stories as the game progresses. There's a event deck that starts stacking up. As you succeed or fail on different missions, as different randomness happens, this deck will become more and more uh, uh, incubated, with the mistakes or the solutions you found. There's gonna be multiple stacks of question mark cards and when my friend sat me down to teach me, he said, this one's bad and that one's bad and this one's bad. Oh yeah, and the one over there, that one's also bad. And if you don't place the majority of your workers in a location, taking a safe action, 
you're going to be pressing your luck a little bit, rolling dice to see if you're able to complete the building project and to see if anything negative happens along the way. That's where the escalation and puzzle of this game starts increasing. You can play it safe, but the odds of you actually winning if you do play safe uh, are going to be less and less. I mean, you have limited actions, a limited breadth of time, and the world is starting to become hungry and hungrier for its own vengeance upon your soul. This game uh, starts escalating in so many cool, interesting ways. First off, in the intro scenario that we played, it's going to escalate around weather. At a certain point, uh, while you're trying to build your fire and, and escape from this island before the boat passes or when the boat passes, you're going to be rolling these weather dice, and they'll start triggering a farther escalation of punishments and challenges, reducing your wood, removing your food, resources that you desperately need to hold on to, or just causing damage to you or whoever's playing the scenario with you. As you resolve and unresolve these different locations, like I said, you'll be stacking up this event deck. That'll become your personal narrative, your story of what has happened and could happen. Did you get bit on the arm? Well, a card goes into that deck to see. Did you build a structure that's not quite as sturdy as it should be? Well, a card goes into that deck to see. Did you explore a part of the island with a hidden cave that allowed you to find some immaculate treasure? Well, you did get to take the treasure home, but a card went into that deck to see. And at the top of every round, You'll be drawing a card from that deck, flipping over into the center of the table, and seeing what has befallen you. Some of these will be standard. Some of these will be consequences or reducing wood or events and risks that could turn into problems if you don't deal with them by, again, allocating your workers to those cards specifically throughout the next turn. Or some of them are going to be responses to the decisions you've made already on the board. This is the part that I didn't expect, or didn't, wasn't aware of when it comes to Robinson Crusoe, the degree to which it allows you to craft your own narrative, the degree to which that story, the mechanics engine of this game really feels like you're the one exploring this island, crafting your resources, making real decisions about how uh, quick and shoddy you build something about what you spend where, how much food you decide to consume, whether or not you take a moment to rest and heal, or if you press forward and run the risk of crossing a beast that will, well, be your demise. This game isn't a thematic game. Let me get that clear. It's a great cooperative puzzle, a great solo engine. It is a worker allocation game. It is a resource management game. I mean, there's so much mechanics at the surface of this. But for me, every single scenario, every single venture into it, every, every element of this system felt so thematic. I didn't think I'd love Robinson Crusoe. I didn't think I'd want to play it again immediately. But like a lot of those other greats out there on the marketplace, with the exception of a few of the intro games, Spirit Island, Terraforming Mars, now Robinson Crusoe, Viticulture would be a good example. People are, are just right. This game deserves to have the awards it has. It deserves to have a collector's edition, and I now want to make sure that I get my hands on it as well. Here's the reality. If you love solo games, if you like uh, crunchy Euro-esque puzzles, and you don't mind a large degree of risk, you don't mind cascading failure, a bit of brutal punishment. I don't know why you wouldn't pick this one up. Start with the intro scenario and start playing through more and more. You see every round, every game is going to have a series of different modules, scenarios, challenges, things that you're trying to accomplish in days that you're journeying through. All of that will be customized based off of the story you're telling. And so... Not only do you have this impact on the game system, you have different asymmetric roles to play, characters that have specializations depending on how they spend their additional resources and additional energy triggering uh, bonus effects or bonus abilities. This makes the cooperative puzzle of it really, really nice. It's not just the same characters doing the same actions every turn. But on top of that, you have modularity in every variation of the game, but then you also have asymmetric different challenges, different different puzzles that you're facing and trying to overcome. But then along with that, you have these different challenges and puzzles you're doing your very best as a player to overcome. It's why, as a solo game, 
that combination of unique challenges, unique characters, random events, and just risk-taking or, uh, you know, uh, pushing your luck systems makes this a rewarding solo story. So, I've talked for a while glowing about a game that I, I really am excited about. Let's get into some of the elements that I think might make this one that you want to steer clear of. First off, it's unforgiving. It really is. Some of these cards that you draw up will just destroy your wood, resulting in you losing food and having to spend your actions the next turn going somewhere to get more, to try to build the thing that you were planning to build that turn. And then a storm is going to come and wipe out your wood and break one of your items and you're going to lose more health. And it's going to continue escalating until you lose the game. And there's going to be some situations, some scenarios that just do not feel fair. It's part of the element of pressure luck. It's part of the nature of this island you're playing on. And when you win, it'll feel good. But the reality is, from even the intro scenario that I've played and the conversations I've had with other people who've enjoyed this game, specifically Andy, he came over and taught me it, there are situations where, like, you didn't want to hunt a beast and you didn't want to hunt a beast for the correct reasons. Because when you did, when you, the game forced you to do so, the beast ripped out your throat. This game has that. This game is not entirely fair or entirely balanced. It is mean and cruel at every turn, and you feel like you're on a forbidden or, uh, you know, abandoned island. That's great if you want that. But if you don't, it's not. As a uh, solo puzzle, I can understand why this is compelling, because you can play multiple scenarios at once. You can continue going through the same journey until you do your best to win, but... I'm not sure I really want to try Robinson Crusoe at three, four players. It'd be a little bit too much wait time, a little bit too much table negotiation. It's a cooperative game where we all have our own little bits of information and items and skills that we have, but at two player, it really worked very well. At one player, I can see it excelling. Anything higher than that, I feel like there'd be one dominant voice at the table, like you have with most cooperative games, really trying to solve the puzzle. And there's a natural reason that that would be the case. This game is hard. Mistakes and utilizing resources in a poor way is a problem. It will likely lead to your demise. And so if you have other, other players around the table that are doing so, and doing so flippantly with your items, your resources, the tribe stuff that you've collectively pulled together, well then... Someone's going to speak up and say, no, you shouldn't do that, or, or please don't build that right now. Here's the reason why. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's why that will cause a chain effect of escalating failure that will start falling apart. I can negotiate those waters at two-player, giving and taking, but three or four, someone's either too loud or someone's constantly being overruled because uh, their strategy just doesn't seem like what the group wants to move forward with. And then finally, uh, the last thing that I'd note would be there's a degree of setup here. A lot of tiles and cards to be placed out, a decent amount of organization, and getting into the game isn't so complicated, but really mastering, understanding the nuance of card design and, and how things resolve, following the turn structure, which is this nice big sheet. Uh, this isn't an intro-level game. This is a uh, full-on, heavy, ambitious puzzle for you to solve. And it'll continue being that. It really is a very, very compelling title. One that I am thrilled that I've been able to play, that I cannot be able, that I cannot wait to bring more content to the channel here. But for now, I'll leave you with my first impressions. My first impressions and thoughts of Robinson Crusoe are this. I understand why people love it. I understand why I might begin or already am starting to love it. This is a mechanically rich, uh, thematically captivating, and brutally unforgiving game. And for me, it's sort of what I'm looking for. I don't want to be able to play the perfect game. I want to see a cool story on the table. And still feel like I've had agency over what has happened. I think my favorite part about this game is the way that event deck specifically starts stacking up. The riskier you are, the more... That event deck is going to represent and reflect the decisions you've made, and the more that might come back to haunt you at later points in this game. The asymmetric player characters are really interesting. I enjoy diving into them. I kind of want to do a deep dive 
on a few of these scenarios. And the one play that I have under my belt so far has me biting at the bit to go ahead and pull out the next scenario and figure out what sort of adventure we're going on to. I, in fact, was able to light the bonfire, hail the boat, and leave the island. It was a harrowing journey, and uh, I'm glad I got to have that experience on the table. It's one that I didn't expect from a title that was, well, so critically acclaimed. I think I sort of wrote it off because of that banner of awards down the front. If you have a copy yourself, get it to the table in the next few days to see if you want to back that collector's edition. If you don't, or you're intrigued, or you're just getting into the hobby space, back with confidence. If you've watched to this point, hopefully I've made it clear why this game may or may not be the right title for you to explore. And if you're a board gamer who's been in the hobby space for a long time and hasn't had a chance to experience this title, I think it's worth doing. Whether you pick up a used copy from a friend, trade on one of the Facebook pages, buy uh, you know, a, just a core box to dig into because your collection's already too big, or you go ahead and back and you wait for the collector's edition to come, I don't think you're going wrong at any step of that path. And with that, my phone's just rang, and I'm going to go ahead and sign out. Whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. We'll see you next time. Thank you.